Hello again, everyone. I'm Craig Corbin, and you're watching Skybox, the only show to take you beyond the scores and stats and straight to the soul of the game. We're starting our show with part two of my conversation with a man who's lived through great adversity and used his faith in God to see him through the tough times. Dalton State head men's basketball coach, Tony Engel. Coach Engel, welcome back again to Coach's Corner. Uh, when we talk about your career, obviously now at Dalton State and the phenomenal work uh, with that first season, but we go back to not only uh, the coaching you did here within the state of Georgia, many different levels, but on the Division I level at Brigham Young University, a name that is easily recognizable to all who follow college basketball. Uh, your time there, both as an assistant and for a period of time as the head coach, uh, of uh, Brigham Young. Talk about that point uh, in those years in your career and how that sort of set the stage for the rest of your coaching life. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, grow, growing up, um, I, I never really attended church or anything like that. My wife was, was a member of, of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. I eventually joined. And you know, in our church, you know, there's there's a thing called the Word of Wisdom where we abstain from uh, alcohol and tobacco. So I always tell everybody, I didn't worry about the tobacco because I quit smoking in the third grade. So, so I didn't have to worry about that. But then the alcohol, when I quit drinking, uh, Budweiser called me for two years. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had to lay off, they laid off the third shift because they, they won't know where they well, where's Engel, you know? They, they, but anyway, a lot of little kids had to go hungry because I quit drinking. But I, but I hadn't had a drink since 1976, Greg. And, but in that, it put me on a highway, it, it, and it sort of gave me a little sign of, you know, this is the kind of life that I wanted to live. My, my father was, a, 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 you know, like a lot of people, but he, he just couldn't handle it. And, and it caused a lot of hardships in our home. And I didn't want to grow up. I love my father, but I didn't want to be like my father, sure. earthly father. So. But with that, I, I progressed in, as a high school coach, as a junior college coach, and I was a head coach at University of Alabama in Huntsville. And then Roger Reed, the head coach at BYU, called, and then I become an assistant at BYU. My first recruit was Sean Bradley, uh, seven foot six, and literally can stand flat footed and hold the rim, was number one player in the nation, uh, went in the NBA, had a successful 13 year career. And, but while I was there, we went to five NCAA tournaments. I, I didn't say I, it's we. Basketball's a we game, not a I game. But I was fortunate enough to be a part of that. We went to five NCAA Division One tournaments, went to NIT, we had success. And right there at the end, things started changing. And stuff started getting a little, little out of kilter. They fired the head coach week uh, before Christmas, hired me as the interim coach, and uh, Matter of fact, my first game coach was here in the Georgia Dome with uh, uh, Georgia. We had a co had a coach named Tubby Smith. So, but we had we had uh, and Rick Pitino was at Kentucky at the time. C Bobby Crimmins was at Georgia Tech. And um, so, but anyway, I was the interim coach trying to salvage what we could, and we were one and six at the time. We'd, we'd beat Larry U. Stacy, a Utah State team, by one basket, and we were one and six. And that's during the Gimme games. Well. After that, they fire the head coach and then hire me as an interim, and I did not want to, to take on that team. We had nine freshmen, and uh, those nine freshmen, 
was a tough gig, well, I coached the team. More importantly, it's still the toughest schedule that BYU's ever had. 14 out of those 19 games was against national ranked opponents. And uh, Craig, we went a perfectly 0 and 19. Did not win a game. And uh, that, that was tough. But I didn't turn my back on those players. I didn't turn my back on the institution. I never blamed the players or blamed the institution. I believe that inferior man blames others while superior man blames himself. I did not have to take that, but I knew when I took that job, I was committing professional suicide. I knew it. Uh, there's no way he was gonna win with nine freshmen in that kind of schedule. And at the end of the year, they let me go. But on the way out to my car, after the president told me that I would not be back, I turned around and said to him, if you ever want to win at all, give me a call. Because I knew there's a national champion in me. And I always said, it's not just one. And I turned and walked to the car. And that national championship would become reality in the not too distant future here in the, the metro Atlanta area with what uh, came to be at Kennesaw State. Well, yes. And just quickly, when I got fired, I had to go home and tell your wife, woman of your dreams, you don't have a job. I never felt like a failure before in my life till then. It's, it's hard feelings, Craig. And I had to tell my children, it was very tough. But unfortunately, Division One basketball, it can be a great profession, but it can be a very tough business. And the business side kicked in. But in those three years, I just, they say, instead of looking without, look within. I fought depression, I fought discouragement. But at the same time, I was a scout, Jerry Sloan and Frank Layden uh, let me scout for the Utah Jazz, so I was able to scout for Utah Jazz. I went into professional speaking, and uh, I, was, I was able to uh, do a lot of things. I had a lot of different odd jobs and so forth. But then, three years later, Kennesaw State job opened. Bobby Crimmins called me, helped me get the job. I came down. Now, Craig, would you hire a guy that was old and 19? <laughs> Who does? But, a, a leap of faith. It, but but I tell you what, the, the kind folks at uh, Kennesaw State gave me an opportunity. Four years later, live on CBS with millions of viewers in March Madness, Kennesaw State, Tony Engel and his basketball team won the only NCAA national championship for basketball in the state of Georgia. And it was a dream. It was a dream. It was something that I knew I, I had in me. I knew the team could do it. We worked hard and we made it become a reality. They say this, two men can do anything if one of them is God and the other one is you. And you plus God equals enough. So I want you to know my faith came through my work ethics. And only the innocent or the ignorant think that they're successful by themselves. We had a lot of success, Dr. Dave Waples, Betty Siegel, a lot of wonderful people there at, uh, at Kennesaw State. We brought in some great players, Terrence Hill, Reggie McCoy, Georgie Joseph, uh, on and on. But, but we all worked hard, we worked together, and we fulfilled that, that dream. Knowing what it was like to have gone through the valley of the experience that you just shared, did it make that mountaintop experience all that much more special? Right, matter of fact, uh, um, Sonny Smith, who was, a lot of people might not know, but Sonny Smith was the coach of Charles Barkley at Auburn. And uh, he's the one that convinced me to do the speaking. He said, Tony, you got one of the best, if not the best, comeback story in sports. 0-19, fired, on the street, and then come back and have the longest winning streak in all of basketball that year. Mm -hmm. That's what's crazy. Mm -hmm. And win a national championship. So how you go from zero to hero kind of thing. Well, it's through your faith and through your work. And what I learned is your faith, your family, and your friends is really absolute. But when I came to Kennesaw State, I actually had the team in the locker room laughing at me when I told them we was going to win a national championship. They, they laughed, but they didn't understand what was in my heart. And and um, we was able to f fulfill that dream. Uh, you know, and we're very fortunate to fulfill it too. A very powerful message. Coach, as always, inspirational to visit with you. Thanks again for being with us on Coach's Corner.
Make sure to tune in each month to see who we've got in the studio. Our next story is all about salsa. In an effort to promote Cuban culture and its dances, Salsa Atlanta has been providing dance instruction to the metro area for over a decade. Originally from Colombia, Julian Mejia has been teaching salsa in Atlanta since 1999. I'm originally from Colombia. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm from a city called Manizales, a small city in the mountains, but I live all my life in Bogota, so I grew up in Bogota. Mm -hmm. And I moved to the States in 93. Okay. 93, and I've been in Atlanta since 99. All right, That's awesome. when I started teaching here. Many people ask Julian, what is salsa? Is it a dance or is it music? That's a really good question because as, as Latino, I say, well, it's, it's, it's music, it's dance, it's, mm -hmm. it's, but pretty much is what salsa is, is, is what we do with chips. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sauce. Okay. And, and yeah. that's where it got the name. Oh, wow. In uh, Danzón started from Danzón, started cha-cha-cha, uh, mm -hmm. son, there were rhythms with influence of, of African music or African Cuban okay. music in yeah. Cuba, rumba, uh, folklore, and all that mix and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it becomes son, and we're talking about now the 40s, son Montuno, and then these musicians, uh, moved out of Cuba, some of them to mm -hmm. Mexico, like Benny Moreo or Perez Prado. Yeah, okay. And back in the 60s, uh, this idea of a record label that started with this music called Fania, mm -hmm. they pretty much renamed, rebranded the music and call it salsa, because right. that's what it is. It's a mix, it's a sauce. There is so many different, different rhythms yeah. that together is what they put, what we call salsa. Okay. So, so that's that's pretty much what it is. And each country has their own music. Like in Dominican Republic, you have bachata and merengue. In right. Colombia, you have cumbia. The mission of Salsa Atlanta is to promote the love for Latin and Cuban music through salsa, a dynamic and significant musical movement. Salsa is not always fast and intense. It can also be slow and romantic, or somewhere in between. We speak Spanish slightly mm -hmm. different with different accent and we use different words. So exactly. Like yeah. The same thing with this music. We dance it different. Okay. But the music is still the same and it's based on the same. It's all Cuban music and it's based on a musical pattern that is called clave. Clave, okay. And clave, it's, it's, a, it's a pattern of eight counts of five notes. E, 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 e. And that the music is based on that. So whatever the music is from, it's, been, it's pretty much the same kind of music. Okay. But we'll dance it different depending where we're from. And if you'd like to learn how to salsa, visit salsacasino.com. Our next segment is This Month in History. We go to Aria Fiore to learn about Billie Jean King's historic win over Bobby Riggs. It's time now for This Month in History. Billie Jean King is an American former world number one professional tennis player. She has won 39 Grand Slam titles, including 12 singles, 16 women's doubles, and 11 mixed doubles titles. King won the singles title at the inaugural WTA Tour Championships. King often represented the United States in the Federation Cup and the Whiteman Cup. She was a member of the victorious United States team in seven Federation Cups and nine Whiteman Cups. For three years, King was the United States captain in the Federation Cup, but perhaps what she is most famous for is her victory at the so-called Battle of the Sexes tennis match against Bobby Riggs when she was 29 in 1973. Riggs had been a top men's player in the 1930s and 1940s in both the amateur and professional ranks. He won the Wimbledon men's singles title in 1939 and was considered the world's number one male tennis player for 1941, 46, and 47. He then became a self-described tennis hustler who played in promotional challenge matches. In 1973, he took on the role of male chauvinist 
claiming that the women's game was so inferior to the men's game that even a 55-year-old like himself could beat the current top female players. He challenged and defeated Margaret Court. King, who previously had rejected challenges from Riggs, then accepted a lucrative financial offer to pay him for $100,000, winner take all. Dubbed the Battle of the Sexes, the Riggs-King match took place at the Houston Astrodome in Texas on September 20th, 1973. The match garnered huge publicity. In front of over 30,000 spectators and a worldwide television audience estimated at 50 million people in 37 countries, 29-year-old King beat the 55-year-old Riggs 6-4, 6-3, and 6-3. The match is considered a very significant event in developing greater recognition and respect for women's tennis. King said, I thought it would set us back 50 years if I didn't win that match. It would ruin the women's tennis tour and affect all women's self-esteem. To beat a 55-year-old guy was no thrill for me. The thrill was exposing a lot of new people to tennis. King believes that she was born with a destiny to work for gender equality in sports and continue until it's achieved. In the 1970s, we had to make it acceptable for people to accept girls and women as athletes, she said. We had to make it okay for them to be active. Those were much scarier times for females in sports. This is Aria Fiore for This Month in History. Down in LaGrange, Georgia, Legacy Museum on Main opened its latest exhibit, A Slice of Our History, Troop County Golf and Golfers. The role of local golfers in Troop County golf courses is revealed with photographs, artifacts, and more. The Skybox team spoke with Troop County historian Clark Johnson about the exhibit and the impact his county has had on the game. Down in LaGrange, Georgia is a small museum, Legacy Museum on Main. It's a history museum devoted particularly to LaGrange and Troop County, Georgia, but to some extent West Georgia and East Alabama as well. The story is very similar. In their rotating gallery this summer, they had a special exhibit, a slice of our history, Troop County Golf and Golfers. A small town by any standard, LaGrange is home to about 30,000 people, and Troop County has about 50,000 total. Well, we kind of think that uh, uh, a place the size of Troop County has had quite an impact on the international, really, world of golf because of some of the famous uh, golf-connected people who have been born and raised in LaGrange or who have made LaGrange or Troop County their home from time to time. Of course, I guess you might start with Ely Calloway Jr., who was born and raised in LaGrange, graduated LaGrange High School, um, who founded Calloway Golf. Uh, everybody knows about the Big Bertha and, you know, his specialty clubs. And, um, then we have his first cousins, Kaysen and his wife, Virginia Calloway, who were born, or well, Kaysen was born and raised in LaGrange. His wife was from Pelham, Georgia, uh, founded Calloway Gardens, which is also in part famed as a golf resort. We had the English brothers, Lionel and Harold Calloway, not that we know of, related to Kaysen and Ely Calloway here in LaGrange, but strangely enough, they, they came to the United States. In fact, their father, Christopher Calloway, uh, was brought to the United States by Donald Ross and ended up mostly at Pinehurst, which is a famous golf course in North Carolina. Um, but before they were at Pinehurst, Lionel and Harold were both here in LaGrange um, for Harold for an extended period of time, Lionel a little bit shorter. Lionel is actually credited with inventing the Callaway handicap system of golf, miniature golf, um, the golf net, practice net. Harold Callaway, um, in addition to having some minor um, fame as being one of the few men who actually beat Bobby Jones uh, in a golf match, which he did here in LaGrange, when he was the pro at uh, Highland Country Club, Harold was the pro. Um, but he also was the coach uh, of Babe Zaharias, which is one of the most famous women golfers of all times. And 
later was the pro at uh, Pinehurst in North Carolina also. Over the years, many people, local and just visiting, have left their mark on Troop County and the game of golf. Bobby Jones, Walter Hagen, uh, several other really famous golfers throughout time have been to play exhibition matches. Uh, ben Hogan uh, here at the Country Club. Suzanne Jackson, one of the most successful uh, women golfers ever, is a native of LaGrange. And we are the home of Alan Doyle, uh, who lives here now, who is probably the winningest amateur golfer ever uh, since Bobby Jones. And he makes his home here, and he's real active in things like first tee. Uh, not a lot of communities our size have a first tee golf uh, connection, but we do, uh, thanks largely to the work of uh, Alan Doyle. And um, through Alan Doyle, a lot of other big names have, you know, been here, and especially members of the senior tour, because Alan uh, really uh, was outstanding. I think he won the U.S. Open senior tour at least twice. In the 1980s, Tad Moore left his job in the industrial park to start a major golf club manufacturing company. Tad Moore hand makes golf clubs here and those are world famous. I, I know there's not a professional that doesn't have a Tad Moore golf club of some sort. We've had quite an impact on the world of golf. This month, Skybox takes you to the Chattahoochee Nature Center located in Roswell, Georgia. The Chattahoochee Nature Center provides a home to over 50 species of injured wildlife. The Nature Center consists of 127 acres of, well, exactly what its name says, nature. From a discovery center to a river boardwalk, a seemingly never-ending river is encompassed by wetlands and woods, accompanied here and there by fault line cliffs. The 430-mile-long Chattahoochee River, known simply as the Hooch by some, is an extremely important water source for Metro Atlanta. AIB met up with Jenny Flanagan, who's been a guide at the Nature Center for five summers. Take a look as she leads us on this excursion on one of Georgia's famous rivers. I ended up at the Nature Center about five years ago, and this is my fifth summer being a canoe guide here, and I just love it. Um, I went out on the river, I guess the last time I went on the river was the last time we went out, which was a couple weeks ago. Um, and it was a really pretty day, and it seems like it's a beautiful day today. It will get about 10 degrees cooler on the river, and um, if you're getting eaten up like I am, once we get on the water, you won't have to worry about it. The bugs kind of go away down there. They don't like moving water. So um, we're going to go over here to the canoe shed, and we're going to get PFDs and paddles, um, and then we'll head down to the dock where our boats are. At the Chattahoochee Nature Center, there's a wide variety of birds, but these aren't purchased animals. The CNC provides care for wildlife creatures that can't care for themselves. We don't take healthy animals and keep them in a cage. These guys just don't know, they can't survive on their own, so we give them a good home. So I like to say for any animal that you see on our property in an aviary or used as an exhibit animal, we've rescued hundreds. Um, we also uh, re rehabilitate um, amphibians and reptiles. So any snakes, turtles, hawks, owls, like I said, any of that stuff you see that's been hurt in Metro Atlanta, you can call us and bring it here and our wildlife staff will take care of it. Um, if you do find a hurt uh, mammal, we can tell you where you can take it, but our wildlife staff is not certified to work with mammals um, anymore. Um, so anyway, other than that, our basic purpose is to educate people of Atlanta about our watershed, the Chattahoochee River, and why is it important. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The Chattahoochee River isn't only a remarkable outdoor nature experience, it can also be a serene escape or an educational adventure. If you hold your hands together and you look at your hands, if you were to drop some water on the top of your hands right there, like your fingers in the forest, all of that water would eventually go to this crack between your hands, and that's the river. So anything that gets thrown on the ground, anything that falls from the sky, any of it within Metro Atlanta is going to run straight into the Chattahoochee River. It's the major watershed in this area. 
before getting in the canoes, our guides gave us a crash course on the proper techniques to safely load and exit the canoes, as well as how to correctly paddle. When you're getting into the boat, uh, the rule is to always have three limbs on the boat. So uh, you should never be walking the boat on the water up like this. That's the easiest way to tip the boat over. So when you're getting in, recommend first just putting your paddle in like so. And when you get in, keep your hands on the side of the boat and then make your way forward to where your seat is. Okay, it is 315 river miles from here to where the Chattahoochee River meets the Flint River and becomes the Apalachicola River and then goes flows through Florida into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's pretty much 315 river miles from here to the border of Georgia and Florida. Got an old Indian shelter there. It's just a beautiful example of our um, forest, our, our deciduous forest of Atlanta. Um, and there's 16 parks like that up and down the Chattahoochee River that are a part of the National Park Service that you can look online. Um, it's mps.gov backslash chat and you can look up all that stuff and go check them out. I highly recommend it. If you guys check out, this cliff is pretty awesome, right? We have a lot of really awesome cliffs like this all along the Chattahoochee. And it's one of our, the really cool things about the Hooch because we are locked in a fault line. You guys know what that means? Y'all know what a fault line is? It's where earthquakes would happen. It's where two plates would, two earth, two pieces of big earth would come up next to each other and cause a big earthquake or fall, come apart from each other. So this is the area where two giant pieces of rock and earth separated from each other and our river kind of just runs right down in it. So because our river is locked in this fault line, it doesn't jump its banks like other rivers do. If you were to look at, at almost any other river on a map, you would see that it kind of looks like a snake and it changes its route and it changes its course, it overflows its banks, it moves, and the hooch does that in some ways, but for the most part, it stays locked in one position because it's in the fault line. And this is one of the oldest fault lines, it's called the Brevard Fault Line. It's what started the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Smokies, um, and it runs all the way up to North Carolina. Our next route, we're gonna go straight over this way and we're gonna check out the wetlands area. Our native animals really like to have their young here. There's trees, there's a nice canopy, there's lots of food. It's usually pretty quiet, there's not a lot going on. So that's one of the really important reasons that one of the reasons the wetlands are really important. And another is all of this muck that we're in right now and these little plants, these little plants actually absorb a lot of the chemical. All right, folks, that's it for today. Hope you've enjoyed it. For AIB TV Skybox, I'm Craig Corbin. We'll see you next time.